Hey sweethearts, it's Rowan, and just a really quick one today. So, it is Sunday, which means it is movie night, uh, and today I am watching The Last Laugh by Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau, who is one of my favorite directors, and, oh wait, this is probably going to be Monday for you when you see this, but... Uh, so this was made 1924 in Germany, meaning it is silent. And I wanted to say something about why I love silent films. Um, while I do have very poor eyesight, at the same time, I'm kind of a... I, I'm... Hmm. It's, it's really odd. I am, I am very, you know, into uh, visuals. So, you know, I can see uh, shapes and colors and... Uh, with my prescription, which is best possible I can get, um, I'm, uh, let's see, I want to say, uh, 20, 40 in, um, this eye. This is my good eye. Uh, 20, 40 in this eye, and about a good 20, 80, 20, 90 in this one, and no real peripheral vision until about here, which is, you know, just like, it's not safe. I've got, like, I've got, like, <clears throat> almost, like, no practical peripheral vision. So, um, so I can see shapes, I can see colors. Um, on a large enough screen, I can watch, you know, television and make out what, you know, everybody is, you know, doing and saying, and I can usually read subtitles. Um, right now, my television, it's a lot smaller than I would like it to be, so, um, if I'm going to be watching something that um, has subtitles, um, I could end up, like, pausing it and then going to sit on the floor so that I can read them more easily, um, but, um, but the thing that I love about silent films is not all the reading that you have to do, but the fact that, um, you know, it is a very different type of acting. The acting in silent films evolved from the stage, um, as, um, I'm sure you know, some might be aware, but it also evolved from, um, like, some actors, uh, came in from the stage, and other actors came in from, uh, modeling, actually. So, like, not just fashion modeling, but artist modeling, and so it, you know, it developed a very different style of acting than what we're used to in modern films. So it's based largely on skills with, uh, with pantomime and mime, which are two, uh, different traditions, but... So it is based largely on mime, um, followed by, uh, pantomime, but yeah, it evolved from modeling, um, just as much as it evolved from stage acting, so, you know, you have these you know, very, you know, especially expressive faces, where in modern film, you know, there's a lot of subtlety, there's a lot of subtlety in the acting, and, um, uh, and that is, that is great, that's great, that's a really great, um, thing, and, you know, it's, it, it, it works for a lot of stories, especially, um, you know, especially in, in films, um, but, um, you know, like, like I said, silent film, it's a very different style of acting. It's, it's very mime-based, so, you know, you've got, you know, like, what, uh, um, you know, where, you know, um, um, Angelina Jolie, you know, could open a door and just have a very subtle, you know, expression of excitement, um, you know, in silent films, it's, you know, you, you have to broaden the expression. And there are some uh, silent film um, actors and actresses who, you know, do have the subtleties um, that we see with, uh, with some uh, modern films, but um, y you don't see that as much. And those are usually the people who made an easier transition to, uh, to sound film. Like, uh, like, like, um, uh, Greta Garbo, though, though she was reluctant for, you know, a while to, you know, she, she held out longer than a lot of actresses, you know, to try and transition to, uh, uh, talking, uh, films, 
because you know she has you know th that she had that heavy Swedish accent and she uh, you know she didn't want to be um, you know basically like you know kicked out of work but you know she uh, she ended up actually transitioning very well and you know she has you know she 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 plays up on subtleties a l very well she's she's very she was very good at that. And, and you know the accent is you know what was a big barrier for a lot of silent film actors in the transition to sound films um but uh oh yeah uh Ramon Navarro um he was also like really good at some of the more subtle um expressions so he transitioned to sound film fairly easily as well um uh and, uh, and then what happened? So, I really, I really love the style of acting. I do. It's, it's, it's very broadly expressive. And it is, I do think it's, like, uh, it, I do think it's just as hard to be good, you know, like, really good and really, like, you know, hone your art as a silent film actor as it is for a sound film actor. Um, simply because, um, you know, you have to, you know, have some control of these expressions as well. Like, you know, if the director wants you, you know, to, you know, come into the room and have, you know, this, you know, very, like, you know, this look of excitement, it has to be the right kind of excitement. So, you know, if you come in looking like far more excited to the point where it's comical, but it's a drama, you know that you're acting in. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta like, you know, find this fine line between, you know, like, like mime, you know, ex, you know, like, like, um, you know, like the broadly expressive like mime type of acting, and then just, you know, being a goof off. And, uh, speaking of Garbo, um, as I'd mentioned, um, so I'm watching, uh, an F.W. Murnau film, and, as I said, Murnau is one of my favorite actors, and there is a, there's a lot, uh, um, so the silent era was actually a pretty decent era um, for LGBT people, at least in the film industry. Um, there were a lot of, um, actors and actresses and, you know, various film crew, including directors, who were not necessarily openly LGBT, but it was very well known in that community. And, you know, on rare occasion, there was, like, you know, one or two, you know, openly LGBT ones. I know, uh, I believe it was, uh, Ala Nazimova. Uh, she was very open about the affairs she had with women. Um, and, uh, oh, crap. I've got a biography about him. Ah, uh, crap. Brain farting on the name. But the biography's title is Wisecracker. And, um, and he was actually, like, fairly openly gay, um, refused to, um, you know, even enter a lavender marriage, you know, just, you know, for, uh, for the, you know, sake of publicity, and it kind of cost him his career in film. <laughs> uh, was a World War One veteran, then moved on to, um, you know, uh, film afterward, and so, uh, so, you know, he was, like, Hollywood's first openly gay, you know, film star. And like I said, uh, Nazimova, she was fairly well known to, uh, you know, have had affairs with men as well as women. And, um, oh, uh, Jean Aker, she was an actress who married, um, Rudolph Valentino. Now, Valentino had had, um, two marriages, both divorced, and at his funeral, Pola Negri claimed to be engaged to him as, you know, before he died, but that's debatable over whether it was, you know, genuine or a publicity stunt on her part. But, um, it is, 
it is at least fairly well accepted that both his lav- both his marriages were lavender, and this is this is supported um, by the fact that you know not only is it considered an open secret that he at least had some affairs with men, um, but um, Gene Aker was a lesbian who you know was sort of you know coaxed into a uh, a marriage with him. And then what happened is, you know, at, you know, she even refused to consummate. It was annulled, like, within a week or so, like, she's just like, nope, nope, can't do this, can't do this, and, you know, is more or less an out lesbian at that point. Um, but I bring this up because, um, Murnau, Murnau was, um, at least after... Um, moving from Germany to Los Angeles, um, you know, to, uh, you know, further his career as a director, he, um, so he moved from Germany to Los Angeles, and at that point, at least in the Hollywood circles, everybody knew he was gay. It wasn't exactly public, it wasn't quite public knowledge, but everybody knew he was gay. And I say it wasn't quite, because when he died in 1931, uh, you see a lot of a lot of places on the internet and elsewhere just sort of you know whitewashing it as an automobile accident, and it was an automobile accident, uh, but it was an automobile accident wherein he was servicing his houseboy, and this is for YouTube, so put your things together. Um, and that was such a scandal in Los Angeles, you know, the exact nature of his automobile accident, that maybe a dozen people attended his funeral. Like, you know, earlier that year, his, uh, his film uh, Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans uh, was released, and is still to this day regarded as to- one of the top 100 films ever made by, uh, by, several, um, by several film critics. And at that point, it, you know, when it, when, it, when it was released, it was regarded as, like, one of the finest films ever made. Definitely the finest film of 1931. And then he died, and maybe a dozen people attended his funeral because of the scandal that, you know, he died servicing his houseboy whilst in the car. Um, and, uh... And one of the few people to attend was Greta Garbo, who kept on her desk um, until the day she died, um, Murnau's uh, death mask, which, you know, would be the mask cast of your face uh, post-mortem, like, you know, before, um, you know, whatever they, you know, uh, definitely before burial, you know, possibly before cremation. Um, so... Yeah, that is, that is, um, that's not one of the reasons that Murnau is one of my favorite directors. I mean, he's, he's definitely one of the finest directors of the silent era. Um, I also really enjoy Fritz Lang, um, also German. Um, I wish I could see more Robert Vine. I do think Vine was... Uh, he, he definitely had a far, um, more visually, um, stunning, um, what's it called, um, expressionist aesthetic with his films. Uh, the only two that I have on, D- on DVD, which are the only two that I have seen, and the only two I've seen available on DVD would be um, most famous by Robert Vine is, um, Cabin of Dr. Caligari. In fact, I've got, um, the, uh, the, the Mezco Silent Screamers action figures, um, of, uh, Calig- of, uh, Dr. Caligari and, uh, Cesar, the somnambulist. And, um, and the other one would be, um, Genuine, uh, Tale of a Vampire, um, and they're using vampire in the 1920s colloquial term of, you know, a, you know, a, of a dangerous, vaguely witchy type, you know, femme fatale sort of woman. Um, 
so uh, so those those are just visually gorgeous films. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, Genuine is far less complete um, than uh, Dr. Caligari is, and so the, uh, the, the plot seems to just kind of meander, um, and is, um, it's got some similarities to A Fool There Was starring Theta Barra, but, uh, it, it is a much different film. It is a much different film. It's, 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 like I said, the, the plot's kind of meandering, but it's got elements that I would comp easily compare to A Fool There Was. If you can find it, I would definitely recommend seeing it. Um, but, uh, um, so those would be my three favorite silent directors. Uh, I want to like Pabst more than I do. Um, <laughs> I, I, um... Oh, no, no, I want to like Griffith more than I do. I do like Pabst. I do like Pabst as, you know, but, um, you know, if, uh, if I were to pick my top three, uh, silent era directors, um, it would be Murnau, Lang, and Vine, just because, even though I've only seen two Vine films, um, it is because, he, you know, he did have this, you know, distinct, um, you know, visual appeal that, you know, you can definitely see that all over uh, Tim Burton films. You can definitely see how the German Expressionists have influenced Tim Burton. And, uh, I mean, you can see YouTube videos where people will, like, you know, just, like, do, like, you know, shot for shot, like, you know, like, look, you know, Tim Burton got this from the German Expressionists from the 20s. There's absolutely no denying that. Uh, as far as my uh, sound film directors who I really love, Ah, uh, top three, n top three without a doubt, uh, Derek Jarman, number one. I know Tim Burton is in the top five, would I put him in the top three? Not sure. I do like Neil Jordan a lot. I do like Neil Jordan a lot. So let's say that Burton and Jordan are tied for two, and then, um... Actually, like, did he do more writing or directing that I loved? Um, I know I like a lot of the ones written by John Hughes. Like, Some Kind of Wonderful is, you know, what I'd like to call the right version of Pretty in Pink. I mean, Pretty in Pink is, a, is enjoyable, but uh, Some Kind of Wonderful just... It, it, it kind of feels a lot more heartfelt, like... And, you know, that's basically, you know, what, what he, you know, what he wrote it as. He's like, you know, this is, you know, this, this is the, uh, you know, John Hughes said that, you know, well, this is basically like a gender-swapped version of Pretty in Pink with the right ending, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, um, I know I like a lot of the ones that... Oh, Guy Madden. No, Guy Madden is number two, and then I'd say, like, Burton and Neil Jordan are tied for number three. So, um, Derek Jarman, Guy Madden, um, Tim Burton, and Neil Jordan tied for number three. So, um, let's see. Yeah, British, Canadian, American, Irish. <laughs> Uh, but my silent, but my silent directors that I really love are all German. Uh, <laughs> don't ask me why. Um, my silent actors that I love the best. Mm. Uh, Conrad Veidt. Oh, I love Conrad Veidt. Um, um, I actually I love Valentino's face a little more than I love his acting. So, but I so I wouldn't put. Um, uh, Valentino in my top three, um, silent film actors and actresses. Um, I definitely love Theda Barra. I love Theda Barra as an actress. She's just, uh, she, she not only has this, you know, amazing presence, but, you know, her expressions can go from, you know, um, you know, they're, they're just as good as some of the more, you know, subtle acting that you see today, but, you know, like, again, like, a little bit less so because of the silent medium. Um, 
and she can just go full on, you know, pantomime expression is, you know, it, you know, facial expressions and gestures and all that. Um, you know, so so she had a wonderful range as an actress. Um, I really wish that she had uh, that she had survived. You know, um, that her career had survived into the sound era, but you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, let's see, uh, Conrad Veidt, um, in fact, I paid so much money for a copy of The Man Who Laughs, which I had previously not seen before, but just because it was, you know, a Conrad Veidt movie, but, like, everybody on the internet knows this as, oh, yeah, the visual inspiration for the Joker, I'm like, I wish people wouldn't just know it for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, Conrad Veidt, Theta Barra, and Louise Brooks. I really like Louise Brooks, but, um, I would have to say Lon Chaney. You know, let's, let's tie Lon Chaney and Louise Brooks, uh, for different reasons. So, um... So, yeah, that's that's just some, you know, quick, randomish thoughts about my love for silent films, and I hope you enjoyed this, and um, I will see you all next time, or you will see me next time I make a video. I'll see some of you the next time you make videos, and I'll see the rest of you if you comment. And speaking of comments, I'm sorry, just shaking bicycle lube. Bicycle lube. Um... Uh, speaking of comments, please like, comment, subscribe, uh, tell your friends, um, if you've, if you've got a little extra money to spare, I've got a Patreon, I've got to buy me a coffee, um, I'm really broke this month all of a sudden because, uh, I no longer have a boyfriend, much less one living with me, so, alright, take care loves, bats and kisses, and goodbye.